my pleasure to introduce Paul Pfeiffer. Paul works in film and photography. He employs recent computer technologies to explore the effect of mass media on human consciousness. He's exhibited at many museums and galleries around the world, including solo shows. And I'm just going to list the major solo shows, otherwise it would be a very long introduction. Solo shows at the Hammer Museum in Los Angeles, the Whitney Museum, the Barbican in London, the Museum of Contemporary Art in Chicago, and the Hamburger Bahnhof in Berlin. He's represented by Paul Cooper Gallery here in New York, by Thomas Dane in London, and Carly Bauer in Berlin. I first saw his work in the 2000 Whitney Biennial, for which he was awarded the inaugural Buxbaum Award. He participated in the 2001 Venice Biennale, and he was a resident at, at MIT, the List Visual Arts Center in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And he was a fellow at the American Academy of Berlin. He received a BFA from the Art Institute in San Francisco and an MFA from Hunter College. He attended the Whitney Independent Study Program, and he recently joined our faculty here in the MFA Fine Arts Program at SVA. Please join me in welcoming Paul Pfeiffer. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. I'm going to um, uh, take a little bit of a different approach um, because um, I uh, just came back from doing um, on my first kind of big project in Asia. And um, it, the title of uh, this exhibition, which I did in Manila, um, was Vitruvian Figure. And that's a title that I've been using for almost like 15 years now. And so I wanted to kind of um, start by unpacking a little bit what the Vitruvian figure is to me. Um, so this first slide, or these first few slides are not of my work, but it's stuff that I downloaded from the internet. Um, this is the front page of a book called uh, The Ten Books of Architecture. And it um, is officially the oldest surviving treatise on architecture in the Western tradition. It was um, written like around the time of Julius Caesar by um, the architect of the guy who became the uh, sort of the official architect of Julius Caesar named Vitruvius. And that's where the, the term Vitruvian figure comes from. Because basically what he did is he, um, as a gift and to get into the good graces of, of the Caesar, put together like a manual that uh, was meant to be a kind of um, primer on statescraft and politics and how to run society for, uh, for Julius Caesar. And um, one of the primary kind of subjects of the book is architecture um, and the, the notion of there being some uh, almost like, well, some principles of architecture that were handed down from the past that need to, needed to be understood. Um, uh, and this book en encoded them. And, and so, I mean, to me, this book is like not just a book about architecture, but it's really about society. And, and Vitruvius really is sort of drawing a connection between like the proper proportions of a building, but then its relationship to the proper proportions of society and even more macro, you know, the proper proportions of the cosmos. Really, it's this idea that like the same principles that rule the gods, rule society, rule the individual body, like everything is sort of nested in, uh, on, on different scales, um, but in relation to these same set of proportions. And probably the most uh, like famous translation of um, these ideas is you know, this like, very iconic image by um, Leonardo da Vinci. Um, this is the Vitruvian figure. And it's just 
a, somehow an illustration of the idea that uh, within simple geometric forms, the circle and the square, um, there is a correspondence with the sort of ideal proportions of the human body. Um, and by association, you know, the ideal proportions of society and so forth. Uh, so we just went from like basically from zero uh, or rather like, you know, first century um, AD to what, like the 15th or yeah, the 15th century. Um, and this is another uh, illustration by a different architect around um, a similar time. This is Ciceriano, another Italian architect of the Renaissance. And um, you could see it wasn't just Leonardo. It was like everybody um, on the same uh, sort of uh, mission to interpret Greco-Roman aesthetic ideas uh, with the new sort of like uh, methodologies of the Renaissance, like, you know, sort of the beginnings of like, um, well, I guess it's slightly before scientific method, but anyway, um, there's both like a, an, an updating and a Christianization of like older pre-Christian um, aesthetic ideas in the Renaissance. And <clears throat> what interests me about these things is that, that what I see is a basically like an unbroken continuous chain that leads up to the present. Um, uh, so uh, another, probably like one of the most important figures in this regard is Palladio, Andrea Palladio, um, who was the guy who most thoroughly re-encoded and translated all of kind of like uh, um, Vitruvius's ideas into um, a kind of a new 10 books on architecture, but his was, I think, a f uh, the four books of architecture, um, basically encoding everything into like an updated form for the, for, for the Renaissance. And if you've ever heard of like, you know, Palladian Villa or, you know, Palladian architecture in general, this was like super, super influential. From there, it basically, these ideas spread across Europe. Um, what is his name? Inigo Jones in, in England then took Palladio's ideas and turned, uh, interpreted, reinterpreted these for like the building of basically all, you know, all state, all kind of aristocratic buildings um, in, in, in the Baroque um, were, were a translation of Palladio's four books on architecture. Um, and you can see, like inside the book, you basically have illustrations of buildings and 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 uh, both the classical, um, the classical columns and the classical orders, handed down basically from antiquity, from like you know centuries before Christ, uh, from from Greece, but like sort of updated for for use and consumption in you know now like the 1600s. Um, this is another sketch, shoot, I think this is actually Leonardo da Vinci, but what I wanted to show in this is that one of the primary kind of examples or forms that's found in all of these treatises from, from Vitruvius onward is uh, the, the stadium. Uh, so basically this is a, a, a kind of a sketch based on the, the Colosseum in Rome. And this is the classical Palladian villa plan. Basically, the Vitruvian figure again, circle and square sort of corresponding as like the kind of ground plan for, for human habitation. This is a, a picture of one of, actual, of one of Palladio's villas. Some, uh, there's like a whole you know, uh, series of them around Venice in the Veneto. Um, that still stands. So, um, you know, for centuries, people from wherever, Germany or, I mean, from different parts of Europe would take the grand tour and would basically come down to Venice to see these. Um, it was considered a part of every artist, every architect's, every musician's, you know, sort of like training, if possible, to actually pilgrimage down to see 
these uh, embodiments of the, 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 the classical principles of, of building, which applied to architecture, applied to painting, applied to sculpt, I mean to uh, music, to everything. Um, this is a picture of Monticello in the United States. So basically you see again um, with uh, you know, folks coming over from Europe to the new whatever, like the new land America, they're importing the same ideas. And these basically if you look at all of the state buildings of Washington DC and you know, I mean every state building is based on the principles of, um, of, of, the, of classical proportion as set out by Vitruvius and Palladio and that whole lineage. Um, this is Corbusier. So now going into the modern, you see again like a repetition of the circle and squared now in this kind of simple, simplified um, minimal form minus all the decoration but still keeping the same sort of idea of carrying the torch of classical proportion, just modernizing it again. And then Philip Johnson um, into the postmodern. Um, again, like, you know, now the skin is removed, it's just glass and, skeleton, and steel skeleton, but it's still the same circle in the square. So, yeah, in a sense, like, uh, I mean, I encountered all of these ideas myself, personally, in like around 1995, uh, 20, 20 years ago, um, when I happened to pick up this book called uh, um, Architecture in the Age of Humanism, I think, is um, Whitcower was the, um, the author of this book, which just like broke down like what these proportions were, the, like just what the, the, the ideas were um, encoded in, in the classical tradition. And <clears throat> what appealed to me is just the idea that, in a sense, what you have is, um, in architectural terms, a, like, a set of ideas that represent kind of Western, um, the West's image of itself, in a way, like Western identity, um, written in sort of mathematical and, and, and aesthetic terms, um, and, and the idea that by adopting this language, you know, you're, and I, I, I could individually as an artist like enter into this tradition and also sort of like play with it. Um, like, you know, play with, play, play with the rules and, and try to break them in order to speak about like how, you know, um, like Western identity looks to me. <laughs> so um, <clears throat> these are some of the first Vitruvian figures that I made myself. They're, they're actually uh, sepia prints or like blueprints. And <clears throat> these were made in like around 1994, 95, 96, when Mac computers were just coming out. And these were also my first experiments with Photoshop. And what I was basically doing is um, I was, uh, uh, I wanted to remake these photo collages in Photoshop um, using as a template uh, the ground plans of, um, of um, like major basilicas. Uh, so this, for example, is uh, St. Peter's in Rome, um, specifically the ground plan by uh, Raphael. Um, since, you know, the, the ground plan, I mean, St. Peter's took a long time to build, and there were you know, several iterations and several architects involved before the thing finally got built. Um, anyway, this was Raphael's plan for St. Peter's, and <clears throat> um, it's a print that's about like six feet high, and this is Pavia Cathedral, uh, and, and <clears throat> basically the way they were made was, um, you know, the, the dark areas are meant to be like the walls of the cathedral seen from above and the dark sort of dots are like the columns and so I kind of reversed the equation and turned the dark areas into negative space uh, by 
like basically taking these bits of photographs that I was uh, scanning from magazines, like specifically like from porno magazines. Like I had this idea of like these being kind of like body, body images. So I was, and I, I just thought it would be whatever, um, a way to, you know, play with it, to, to actually use, you know, images from, from porno magazines. So um, like all the dark areas are sort of lined with um, mouths and, um, and anuses and basically orifices sort of like, you know, like uh, um, receiving these phalluses. So the dark areas become these like absent phalluses that are being like sucked on by like mouths. So you have to get like really close up to see them, but then, and then when you, for, for me they also became like these, like these things become like, you know, images of hell or something. Um, and then around the same time, I, I, this was another kind of experiment in Photoshop. Um, this time, I, I, I was, uh, these next prints are called the, the Temple of Solomon. And they're based on, again, a ground plan, like a massive ground plan that was never built for the recreation of t uh, the Temple of Solomon by a Spanish Baroque architect named um, Villapando. And <clears throat> what I was doing is actually like scanning the scalp of a Barbie doll with all the hair rem removed from the scalp. And so, and then sort of piecing that together to, to reform the, you know, the, the, the ground plan for the Temple of Solomon. And, you know, this is like late 90s and I, I don't know, I just, um, I just like the idea of, you know, this kind of like very, this plastic body being superimposed onto this sort of like classical body um, to create all, like, like a cyborg or something. You know, like in the late 90s, it was all, like all about the cyborg. And so I did it in different colors. Like this was Ebony Barbie. And then <clears throat> to jump forward to I don't, like, um, I think like 2001 or 2002. This is uh, next, the next photographs are like, for me a very big jump um, from, uh, from different ways of working to like squarely a kind of like appropriation um, method of working. Like at a certain point I, I just, instead of creating my own pictures, I just you know, got this idea that a lot of what I was really trying to do was already in like certain pictures and just by appropriating those pictures, it, it was much more straightforward and, and it was just a different way of speaking or like, you know, of, of, of um, developing a language as an artist. So I, I, was, I started taking um, uh, images from the NBA archive and making these photos uh, like, you know, stripping down, like taking off all the, the team names and numbers and, and other details. And these, so this series is called The Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse. I, yeah, I don't know, you know, and, I mean, you saw the first one in some ways, not just that literal example, but, you know, in all of these in a way to me, you know, become kind of like these new sort of like Vitruvian figures. Um, that's, this is a armature of a video and uh, that is like a very small screen because um, like uh, when when I start, first started playing with video as an extension of like playing with Photoshop and you know just starting to play around in the 
around around 1999 with um, with software like Premiere um, and After Effects. Um, I had this idea of using these small monitors or small projectors. Um, since at the time, mostly video was shown like super big. So this is um, this video is called John 316, and it plays on that like that suspended monitor on a pole. This is actually in the Greater New York show in 2000. And I mean, it's, yeah. The one thing I have to say is like, you know, 2015 is, uh, you know, like so much has happened since from, from 2000 to 2015. So in a way, it's kind of hard to imagine like, you know, I mean, this was before like, you know, seeing video on cell phones. So in a way, um, it just it's, it becomes part of the piece for me that like, you know, this thing is like a time capsule as technology has very, very quickly uh, evolved. And, um, and, and sort of, you know, a thing about this that like was important to me was um, that since, you know, I didn't have any background in, in filmmaking or, or um, video making at all. Um, really my background is in printmaking. So, you know, I'm like coming through Photoshop and, and, and video is like an extension of like you know, f playing with photos in Photoshop. And so <clears throat> there was, you know, I, I had no skill or interest in making kind of linear narratives in, in sort of, you know, film school um, way. And so really like every, everything for me was like a loop and, and um, was meant, I, I thought it would be, it was just, you know, the basic idea of like looking at video the way you would look at a painting, like where, there, it's you know it's sort of un, detached from any kind of linear progression. It's more like something that, as a viewer, you know you can decide how long to look and so forth. And so the viewer navigates time, and time, you know temporality is kept totally open. <clears throat> so there's another video from the same time, um, and that's like a little um, CPJ Sony projector that was like the original mini projector for parties and I just like, I used a, um, a mount that I got from like a security camera supply on Canal Street and just like turned it upside down. So again, it was designed to just, you know, play continually without ever changing just this loop. And so you would like, you know, come up to it and see it without and then go away from it um, like a still image in a way. And this the first time I showed these, they were shown like together, actually, like bookends. So this, the title of this piece is uh, The Pure Products Go Crazy. And the title of the last one was um, Fragment of a Crucifixion. And the title of this one is Live Evil. And that's just to show you the, the way it's projected is by two projectors into a corner. I also want to show you, it's, this is actually, I, I did a whole s series of um, live evil videos. 
And they all, they all come from the same place. It's the same, it's, it's a particular Michael Jackson concert um, that was you know, performed around the world. So um, like, I just like this idea of the same image, but you know, this one I think is like in Malaysia and uh, the last one was in Bucharest. And he's doing the same thing. He's singing Stranger in Moscow and um, he's doing like the moonwalk. There's like a moment in the middle of that song where he, he does the moonwalk. And then um, uh, I just have a, a couple of more videos to show you. This one is, is um, from a triptych called The Long Count. And they're a series of images of um, famed, famous Muhammad Ali fights. This is the rumble in the jungle. And I'm just taking the last knockout round and removing the boxers. So you see like, you know, the three minute knockout round without the boxers there. But actually I'm gonna go forward. This is another one from, the, from that triptych. And this one should have sound. The, the, sound, the soundtrack of this piece is actually, uh, was a collaboration with a, an artist named Chris Kubik. And he was taking um, interviews with the various, with, with Muhammad Ali and Joe Frazier, and then picking out the words and leaving just like everything in between the words. So in some ways like a sonic counterpart to what I was doing visually. And just running through these, this is um, a, a video called Desiderata.
And <clears throat> that's just to show you, it's actually shown on like a little portable DVD player. Um, so actually really small. Uh, are you referring to the, the image? Yeah, the images all come from The Price is Right. But then, you know, we, I sort of expanded the stage set by like doubling the stage set to make it sort of bigger. Um, so uh, I think this is like the last thing I have to show you. This is um, a, a video that uh, I did in 2001 and it was a commission from, uh, by um, the Public Art Fund uh, and it was uh, a two and a half month long video that played in the World Trade Center. I think it was like one of the last artworks to be shown in the, in the World Trade Center. And um, it was called Orpheus Descending. <clears throat> and it was basically the image of like the life cycle of a flock of chickens or a, like a pen of chickens um, that was shot. I mean, the chickens were grown upstate, uh, free range, and shot in a kind of natural setting. And then, and they were shot in real time using like a security camera, well, a, a number of security cameras um, hooked up to a switcher. So it would like switch angles every, every few seconds. And so it was like, you know, it was just like this real time image of these chickens living and whatever, eating and sleeping um, over a two and a half month, over the span of their lives, basically. And then the idea was to play back this two and a half month video in real time in the corridors of the World Trade Center so that basically, you know, the, the audience for it would be all the commuters going in and out of the building day by day. So, you know, it was for a very specific captive audience. Um, and so I just wanted to show you, this is like, you know, um, like highlights from the video. Um, like this is, you know, the first two weeks were just images of the eggs incubating and then hatching. And then probably like another, you know, like two weeks take place in the chick pen. And then the last, uh, six weeks all happen outdoors um, where you see like the the chickens basically do their daily thing and so you know the idea is if you went at midnight you would see the chickens sleeping um, if you went like early like right around rush hour in the morning you would see them like you know like sort of jumping to catch insects in the air The images, we, we got permission from Bloomberg to use some of the monitors that usually show advertising. And they're sort of positioned above these hallways where people are walking through. So you, would, you, know, you, know, you wouldn't really be able to like stop and watch it. You would just always like watch it for a few seconds as you were walking to work or like coming back from work and heading for the subway. It started on Easter Sunday and then ran for two and a half months. <laughs> Um, which I thought, you know, just gave it like a, a playful, but also like a religious symbolic dimension to it. And you, it wouldn't have looked like this. Um, you're really seeing like short pieces from, um, but really like there would be much less happening. Um, okay, actually I just realized I have a couple more things. This, yeah. Um, well, this, this is a piece called Empire, and it, it um, was in, basically inspired by Orpheus Descending. And in this case, uh, it, it, this is the life cycle of a, uh, a wasp nest that was shot in Georgia in real time using uh, like a digital recorder. And um, this is more like what you would see, like basically, close to nothing. Like now the queen is just, I don't know, doing like maybe uh, tending uh, an egg or a larva. And it, so this piece now runs for three months. 
Um, unlike the previous piece, it was meant to be portable, and now it's like housed in this, you know, in, in a case. And um, I just like the idea of this being a kind of an, an object that is where the, the presence of it actually comes from this sculptural box rather than the video itself, and the video becomes like sort of not viewable except in tiny fragments where nothing in particular happens. But cumulatively, over three months, you actually have the full, like this amazing story of like, you know, like grubs turning into wasps and wasps being born out of these cells and like the whole life of like, uh, like a colony. I also like the idea that, you know, wasps being sort of like, you know, like this kind of like vermin type creature, but always in proximity to humans. You know, this is like a paper wasp. So basically the paper wasp makes its nest out of like bits of newspaper. So it's really like an animal only found around um, humans. Um, and so that actually, so the way I wanted to end this was is to sh show you a couple of very new things. And um, this first one is called Vitruvian Figure. And um, in the last few years, I've been engaged in, in going back to the Vitruvian Figure in sculptural form now. And, um, and so this, uh, this is a piece that was uh, originally shown at the Hamburger Bahnhof in Berlin as part of a bigger installation, um, which was a sound installation. Um, and anyway, it was it basically a, a quarter stadium um, sandwich between one-way mirrors. So like basically if you, from one particular angle, you could look over the rim and see the full stadium um, composed from the actual wooden one-fourth stadium reflected in these mirrors to create like a whole stadium. Yeah. Um, and this is part of a bigger installation. Um, I won't tarry on it, but I, I do want to just put it in context. The, the way that this, this uh, series of works was sort of choreographed at Hamburger Bahnhof you started out seeing the, the wasp nest, and then you saw this, and then you entered into this big room that was empty, but like is lined with speakers that recreate in sort of three dimensions the sound of this uh, football crowd. Um, but I feel like I, it's too much to go into it, so I'm gonna sort of skip through it. Um, and then show you another Vitruvian figure um, which uh, was commissioned for the Sydney Biennial in 2008. And um, it was really like, I mean, in a way, the most interesting part of it, well, it was a collaboration with uh, uh, a architect called BVN. They built um, the Sydney Olympic Stadium and they agreed to like basically hand over their plans for Sydney Olympic Stadium and then uh, let me work with some of their designers to expand the Sydney Olympic Stadium, which was a 100-seater, 100,000-seat stadium, into a million-seat stadium. Um, basically, like, expand it 10 times into, like, a theoretical million-seat stadium, um, which is, you know, never existed, but actually, you know, was, it, was plans for such a thing were made by the Nazis. <laughs> um, and then we took this plan to Manila, um, which in the last few years I've started kind of like working there because I just like the idea of having a studio, I mean, using a city like Manila as a studio. And so uh, put together a team um, to actually produce a model of this million seat stadium. And so these are just like some images of the team. Um, No, this, basically this was done 
in 2008. It was like, you know, constructed over a period of like three months, then shipped to Sydney, shown once. Like it was very jerry-rigged. Like the whole thing was extremely delicate. It was like, a, you know, it was uh, like 28 feet across. Uh, this giant piece of jewelry. <laughs> It was only ever shown once. It was like magically collected by this crazy Brazilian collection called Inho Team. Um, it's like this um, like major industrialist in, in Brazil who like has built this sort of like theme park museum in the Amazon and has like crazy projects out there. And then this is this piece I just finished. This is again a piece uh, produced in Manila and it's, on, it's part of the show that I was uh, telling you about. Uh, and um, in this case, it's, it's um, a half stadium that's bisected by a mirror wall. And so the idea is like basically you, as you walk around it, you always see the completed, um, what appears like the completed uh, amphitheater. Um, but it's always partially composed of a reflection. I, I wish I could show you, I, the, there was a second part to this production, which is a, a, a two-channel video, and I will just have to wait for an opportunity to do that in the future, because I don't have documentation of it yet. Um, but maybe, yeah, a little later, I could tell you a little bit more about this, because it's very particular. It's, it's basically a, a model of a, a megachurch that just opened in, that just opened its doors in, in the Philippines and currently is the biggest indoor theater in the world. Um, 60,000 seats um, in an amphitheater form. So like there's a stage and then there's like 60,000 seats. Yeah, and uh, kind of amazing to me that, you know, this largest theater in the world is actually a church. Um, again, like, no time to talk about it really, but I just wanted to show this. This is another recent sculpture from 2012 called The Playroom. And in a sense, just in terms of abstract form, uh, I think of it as another Vitruvian figure. It's not, actually. Yeah, this is, um, yeah, it's a model of, of um, it's about six feet wide. Um, and it's, it's, a, it's a model of a, um, a real piece of architecture, which is like a, a, like a, um, like a notor whatever, like a notorious or a famous room from a 1970s mansion, um, a sunken living room from the mansion of Wilt Chamberlain um, in LA. And so actually what I wanna do from here is just to show you one last video, which is like super fresh off. I mean, I just, just finished it. Um, and it's part of, again, this exhibition that I have up right now in Manila. And I'm very excited about it because it represents just like a new kind of um, departure for me. And it's called Boomerang. And it's, um, it's actually, it's like, it's sort of a, Reperformance of uh, performance from 1974, um, Richard Serra and Nancy Holt, um, and this is like apparently one of the first live broadcast performances in you know I mean the history of video art and, or performance art. It was it was performed in a TV recording studio in Texas in 1974 and broadcast live. So if you like turn to the public um, TV channel in like Austin, Texas in 1974, you would see this thing happening um, live from like some recording studio somewhere. Yes, I, yes, I, 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 I can hear, I can my, hear my echo. echo. And, and uh, uh, the, words the words are coming, are coming back, back on, on in top, in top of, of me. Uh, uh, the, words the words are spilling, are spilling out, out of my head, head 
and then, and then returning, returning into, into my, my ear. It, it uh, puts, a, puts distance a distance between, between the, the words and their apprehension, their apprehension or, their, or their, comprehension. their comprehension. The words, the words coming, coming back, back seem slow. slow. They don't, they don't seem, seem to have the have same, the same forcefulness, forcefulness as when, as when I, speak I speak them. them. I think, I think it's, it's also, also slowing, slowing me down. Me down. I, think I think that it that makes, it makes my, my thinking, thinking slower. I have, I a, have double a double take, take on, myself. on myself. I am once, I am once removed, removed from, myself. from myself. So that's, that's the original. And um, I downloaded it from YouTube. Um, where you can find it. Um, and then <clears throat> I, um, like I engaged a group of college students in, in uh, Manila to re-perform it um, using a, a, like a group recita recitation technique, which is, um, you know, which is found in, in um, schools in the Philippines as part of like, it's a class called uh, oral communication. And um, you know, it's a way of like practicing self-presentation on a stage, and also like, I mean, I basically co-taught a class in oral communication um, as a way to create this performance. And so, um, I'm just going to show you the result. goes on but I'm gonna leave it at leave it there so <clears throat> that's it the last I'm just gonna I'm gonna play this last video and just let it run because it's silent and it's like a about 15 20 minutes video That's it. That's my presentation. <laughs> my question is, uh, I guess your, your videos, um, the ones that are on a loop, were pre-meme. But like now, looking at them without, like, I guess, obviously, the context of you and what your work is about and when it was made. but. Um, how now, looking back on it, do you see it intersecting with meme culture or, or not? Or is that something you reject? Or 
Yeah, no, you know what? I actually, I usually, you know, get, I mean, I usually think of them in relation to gifts. Gifts. Oh, yeah, are those not? Because they're gifts? like, Gifts, gifts are different. moving, yeah. but Sorry. actually, I know I think meme, meme is different. like a really good because you know I always, in some ways, no, I don't reject it at all. I think in some ways, you know, um, I, I, I've always been interested in um, how working with videos in this way. Um, like relates to advertising, and I think memes relate to advertising. Yeah. Um, somehow, like the idea that that um, that you know that you could capitalize on the way that people naturally um, consume or like absorb images, um, which is you know intuitively first, and in a way like non didactically, um, you know, like a thing imprints itself on your brain and becomes memorable um, in a sense like visually rather than you know as a matter of ideology so I mean in some sense I've always you know thought of, of uh, like advertising working this way and I've always been you know interested in how like working with images myself you know and wanting to make memorable images one could somehow you know play with those principles from advertising and what your question makes me think is that in some ways, you know, we've, we've all adopted this, you know, the, the kind of the methodology of advertising in the sense that, you know, we all kind of like exchange ideas via memes now. I mean, I also think, you know, in some ways there's a relationship between memes and some like, you know, the, I mean, I, I'm not an expert in this at all, but you know, the at least the the principles, if you subscribe to them, of like of hypnosis. Um, from your videos of like the basketball, the basketball games, and like Michael Jackson, Jacks, uh, I can't even speak, Michael Jackson's concerts. I wasn't sure if you wanted to go off of the topic of like spirituality and like religion or I wasn't sure if you wanted to explore that in your videos. Well, yeah, I mean, I guess I'm, I'm I've all, I mean, I've, you know, I'm interested in, in, I mean, I've used a lot of biblical titles and biblical or religious references I mean, one thing is that, you know, there is this, I mean, what happened in the Renaissance was a, a literal Christianization of these, you know, to my mind, like really kind of fundamental um, aesthetic ideas. So in a sense, like, you know, the religious dimension has always been there. Um, and if anything, it becomes, you know, it's just, it becomes part of the appropriation in, in um, taking up certain forms. But then I also feel like you know religion circulates in popular culture in in really strong ways, um, and I, you know in a way to just you know I, I'm interested in, in in evoking a religious dimension because of it. I think it's you know because I I think it's such a strong aspect of pop culture. Well, <clears throat> the title of this video is, is Morning After the Deluge, which is um, you know, taken from a, a, a painting by Turner, um, but then is a reference to the, the, um, you know, the story of Noah's Ark and the biblical flood. And, you know, it's, I mean, uh, in a way, well, the morning after the deluge would be like the morning after the complete annihilation of the world. And I think part of it is also that, you know, I think, pop culture and media culture is literally awash with, you know, images that have to do with the end of the world. You know, ISIS is, exists because it's almost the end of the world. You know what I'm saying? That's the rationale for 
ICE's whole project. Um, so, you know, in, in very, very aggressive ways, you know, um, notions of biblical proportion and of like, you know, Armageddon are, um, are front and center in pop culture now. I guess what I wanted to say, was that intentional or like you explain religion, was that intentional or no? I mean, you know, pol I mean, to politicize it, for me, you know, appropriation and, and playing with images from, from pop culture, you know, has to do with some idea that, that we're, you know, that images are being used to really stoke, like, very potentially um, destructive ideas. Um, like, you know, the, the sort of us versus them, um, you know, sort of mindset is, you know, regularly being promoted through images now. And I know, just, you know, like very retrograde ideas of, of, of what belonging is supposed to be and, and, you know, kind of who the enemy is. And, and, and I don't know, you know, like, like just um, attempts at sort of like, you know, just defining social order through like very kind of like, crass and, and destruct in, in crass and destructive terms, you know, that's, I feel in some ways like the, the primary usage of images. So to take these images is to like really, you know, seek some alternative or to, you know, to promote um, some other understanding. And I mean, in a sense, like, you know, my, to go back to the Vitruvian figure idea, and this connects with like, you know, what you're saying about, um, about playing with religious, uh, um, like titles and references, you know, it's, it's very intentional. It's not accidental at all. And it's really, it's about, you know, I mean, an understanding that in some ways, um, you know, there, there has, um, like we're really, you know, that what, what the Vitruvian figure represents is this, um, you know, prolonged engagement and, and attachment to very simple forms to describe, you know, human relationships and society and, and, and the kind of fundamental ideas of like, you know, what, uh, how we are and how we live together. And that, you know, that in some ways, these, well, these, you know, these very simple forms are, are a misinterpretation and um, they can easily be like appropriated to mean very destructive things, you know, like, Symmetry, um, you know, can I mean easily becomes some like very nationalistic idea of, you know, me versus or us versus them, and um, you know the annihilation of them in order to create the fulfillment or the wholeness of us, and. Um, so, you know, for me, it's about like a rejection of that, of, of these very destructive forms of like uh, the interpretation, the misinterpretation, I would say, of like these very fundamental, ancient, aesthetic principles that for better or worse, we continue to live with. And I don't know, as a way to like, you know, look at them and, and um, experientially like, you know, to, um, like, unpack them. Sorry, that's like, wow. Thanks. So, I feel like a lot of your work, not all of it, but a lot of it deals with spectacle. Athletes, Michael Jackson, huge stadiums, churches, even the sunset. Maybe not the chickens and the insects. But, um, and it's causing, seeing it all together is causing me to rethink my understanding of spectacle. I had tended to think of it in terms of Guy Debord and this idea of a kind of image that, I, that exists in an economy of images. And your work deals with that. But it also deals, I think, with 
and maybe it was your talk about the Vitruvian body and, and classical architecture with power and a way th that certain kinds of images organize us into collectivities and hierarchies. Do you think much about spectacle in relation to your work? Yeah. Um, well, I mean, y yes. Um, I always have. I, you know, I, I think about, um, I mean, in a way, a primary kind of like scene for my work is the stadium. Um, and you know, there's, I've always been, you know, like attracted to, to the stadium because, you know, I think of it as the uh, kind of, I mean, it's, it's um, a piece of architecture that um, is emblematic of current, of contemporary society. Um, and in a way, it's just, you know, in a way, to me, a stadium is a, like a giant broadcast studio. Um, and, you know, sort of one of the, primary sites for the use of video. Um, so, you know, there's also like an interest in like the history of, of image making um, and the history of video that leads me to that site. Um, and, you know, I guess uh, I've, I've always thought that at least there's a potential that in um, working in the context of, of um, contemporary art, that you know, you're you're not dealing with um, a stadium situation. You're dealing with a very different condition of of viewing. Um, you know, it, and and I always imagine uh, these images that refer to the stadium are actually ultimately only viewed in you know small numbers in a very like, you know, sort of quiet um, uh, situation that's divorced from like, you know, the craziness of like image consumption in, a, in, an, in an arena. So I, it was really about that, like, you know, moving the spectacle from um, a space of like immersion and where, you know, you, you I mean, it, it, it is controlling you more than you controlling it to this other situation, which is quieter, in a sense, you know, like uh, the, the viewing space of art, to me, is, is, is like a laboratory where, you know, you are afforded a space to step back and reflect and, you know, to meditate on what you're consuming. So um, there was this idea, you know, from the start that, um, that this, you know, that this, um, um, that moving spectacle into this other space would create a, like a very different kind of situation. It was a way to comment on it um, because it was, you know, because it's because of the distance from the actual, you know, sites of spectacle. I'm now thinking about like, you know, I just came back from like the art fair in Hong Kong and in some ways, the line between the two is like, you know, super blurred. So I don't have a full answer for your question. I think we maybe have time for one more question. So, <laughs> um, so I guess in the exploration of your work, you often, um, you're talking about the Vitruvian figure and I guess in architecture and I guess the study of like um, human proportions, it's kind of like in some way a reach towards perfec perfection and like um, this idea of like perfect proportion to the cosmos and to the earth and to relation. But um, I guess on some level, like some of the videos with the athletes and Ali and um, that fight and then um, Michael Jackson, it could be perceived that um, in the work in calling those figures um, Vitruvian or talking about them in that construct could be seen as perfection being the black body and then um, perfection as far as mind being the white mind. So like in that kind of like contrast, um, could you talk about how you like source the material you choose to use for your videos? Yeah. Um, uh, well, you know, I mean, all of these images are coming from, um, 
uh, you know, scenes of arenas and specifically like sports. And um, yeah, I mean, to address what you're pointing to directly, you know, there's obviously a, a racial uh, aspect to these scenes, meaning, you know, like um, a basketball game or, um, um, you know, any like professional sports event. Uh, I mean, I would answer your question in the same um, way as, you know, the questions about religion. Like, I'm not so much trying to, you know, take a, um, like an unambiguous position in regards to religion or race. Um, uh, you know, I mean, I have my own personal views, but I also, you know, I, to me, art is not about like, you know, um, uh, like promoting your personal views of things. It, it's, to me, it's much more interesting, you know, to approach art as, as a matter of, you know, like creating images that, um, you know, that, that um, where, where like meaning becomes a question um, more than like a definitive like, you know, answer. So, um, you know, all I mean, I, all I can say about like this um, binary of like black body and white mind is that, um, you know, in a sense, you're talking about the, you're talking about Cartesian dualism. Um, and this is a very old idea. And, you know, in a sense, um, I'm, I mean, it's an idea that I'm extremely critical of in the same way that I'm critical of like notions of like, you know, perfect bodies or perfect societies or, you know, perfect anything. Like to me, the whole point is, you know, to really um, unpack the notion of, you know, entities, whether they be societies or bodies or individuals being whole in any way, you know, like this is a, I mean, each one of these images presents, you know, a visual contradiction. Um, it's the opposite of wholeness. And in a way, I'm presenting these ideas visually, you know, to counteract like what I see as the kind of false, you know, uh, um, uh, beliefs in, in, you know, wholeness as, as a transparent, like, you know, natural thing. Yeah, I mean, in some ways, I mean, just, uh, I mean, there's a direct connection between, like, you know, the, the kind of um, identification with race and the identification with nation, mm -hmm. you know, with nationalism. And these are, like, super big subjects, you know, I, and I'm, I'm, I'm trying to, you know, find, like, I'm, I'm finding way, ways to speak about these things in relation to the language of architecture and, um, you know, that's why I sort of focus on the Vitruvian figure. You know, I feel like there's ways to approach this that I hope don't get embroiled in like, you know, in a way sort of like superficial debate about, you know, like the problems of society because, you know, this tends to get stuck on like a certain level. And to me, like these subjects go very, very, very deep.